colleague Spencer, and we're here on behalf of Winslow Consulting. Today we'll be discussing the Dakota Access Pipeline and the low value business. We respect your time and have put together a presentation that discusses the issue of it. So we are aware that Assistant Secretary Terry Darcy has briefed you on this issue, but we first want to take a quick five to seven minutes to run through the background and define the problem. We will then go ahead and look at each stakeholder from three perspectives. We'll conclude this with a recommendation that we feel benefits the broadest public along with the implementation strategy to go ahead and implement that recommendation. So who are the stakeholders at play here? Well, on one side, we have the oil company Energy Capital Partners, as well as any other financially incentivized stakeholder. And on the other hand, we have the broader public, potential workers, and the Standing Rock Street Tribe, which we'll discuss later. So like I said before, we're going to look at this from three perspectives. The legal perspective, the financial perspective, and as well as most importantly, the ethical perspective. So what is the Standing Rock, what is the Dakota Access Pipeline? Well, in the upper right hand corner, we can see that it is an 1100 mile underground pipeline that transports shale oil. It starts in North Dakota, travels through multiple states, and ends in the city of Patoka, Illinois. With the pipeline being 80% finished, the pipeline is claimed to be a safer, quicker, and more independent route to transport oil in the US. Sounds great, so where's the problem? Well, as you can see, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline must travel through the Missouri River. Now, the Missouri River is a water source for the Standing Rock Tribe, as well as many others in the Northwest region. And they feel that it ha will be hazardous, as well as harmful to not only them, but to society at large. Now let's take a look at this from the legal perspective. All right. To begin with, since the proposal of Dakota Access Pipeline in 2014, there have been many permits they had to acquire. This goes through many laws and many acts that serve the best well-being of the public and the general public, the general public and citizens. We're going to focus on these three, seeing that we can't address all of them. So first, we're going to go into Section 10 River and Arbor Act, also known as Nationwide Permits Bill. The main purpose of this act is to serve, to view the public interest, what they care about, what they're worried about, whether it be the land use, the compensation, the geology of the land, whatever it is, Dakota Access Pipeline has to take it upon themselves to realize, you know, these are the problems that we want to address. These are the things that we are worried about. So Dakota Access Pipeline held over 300 meetings in which the general public could come in and voice their concerns, whether it be about their primary source of water, um, the compensation that they will or may not receive. Because of this, they're able to give documentation with the preventative measures they're planning on taking to serve these interests, um, such as the SCEDA technology, which is systematic um, computations and data acquisition, as well as CPM measures, which includes leak prevention, which has sensors all around the pipeline so they can see when something goes wrong. It makes sure that the integrity of the pipeline is intact. This serves to help um, the concerns of the public where they feel that their water source might be compromised, pipe or burst. Next, we're gonna go on to the Clean Water Act. This is a more narrow scope on the River and Arbor Act, focusing primarily on the water. As you see here, reject if it's damaging to the nation's water, also if it's injurious to the public interest. Before this current pipeline route, there were 300 other alternatives. One specifically was this one. They actually, that's this one right here, and they chose to decline that one because they checked out the environment and they saw that there was potential harm there. It would have gone through 500 also, in addition to the ones that we go through now, 500 additional houses that it would impact. It would also have greater harm on the water and it would also harm the wells. Because of this, they denied that one, and we have the current route now, which is going under Lake Oahe, which is actually a five or 0.5 mile difference between the pipe and the actual river. This is what is most, uh, this is what brings the most fear into the Sioux Tribe members and the citizens, seeing that if the integrity of the pipeline 
were to be compromised, that it would directly affect their water, directly affect the health of their citizens. Next, we're going to go into the National Environmental Policy Act. This directly correlates to the environmental impact statement. In 2014, or 2016, apologies, um, Obama sent out an executive order stating that we had to do this environmental impact statement because it was in the best concern of the public. The Sioux tribe was worried about their water, and because of this, we felt this was necessary. Even though the nationwide permit overrides this, because they had the nationwide permit, they no longer had to do the environmental impact statement. And President Obama felt that this was necessary because we had to recognize the concerns that they had and address them. These are the steps that they had to take, starting with notice and intent, in which expertise, engineers, environmentalists will go onto the land and see, is the infrastructure right for this? If something goes wrong with the pipeline, could we fix it in time? Would we be able you know, to go around the school and make sure no one's harmed? Would we be able to um, keep the water safe? From this, um, they would have a draft environmental impact statement in which the government and the public could voice their comments and their concerns. From this, they would take that into consideration along with the, um, along with the analysis that they did and form a final environmental impact statement where they would make their decision. Would be, we think we should go along with this. We think we should continue this. And this is in the best interest of the public or if it's not, whichever they decide. So as Spencer explained, from a legal perspective, we feel there is no reason to deny the easement and therefore we should grant the easement to go ahead and complete the pipeline. Let's take a look at this from a financial perspective. So before we go in from to the financial perspective, we want to understand. We want you to understand that we take into consideration that financially, it is not your, under your jurisdiction to take into the cost of this pipeline. But we do want to take everything into consideration. So first, we, we do want you to understand that the, the completion of this pipeline will allow. The completion of this pipeline will allow the U.S. to become more independent and source their own oil. This will not only dramatically decrease the amount we spend on foreign oil, but substantially increase the, uh, our allowance on the U.S. oil, substantially boosting our economy. Right now, the U.S. imports over 9.2 million barrels of oil a day. With this pipeline, we will decrease that by 5% as well as the transportation costs. We will substantially decrease the transportation costs, which I'll talk about in the slide following. So what is, what is the pipeline, what is the energy transfer partners doing to compensate the disruptive parties here? Well, they are compensating each party for the land that will, they will go through, as well as taking preventative measures, which we'll talk about in depth in our recommendations. So as I, as I said before, the transportation cost will be dramatically decreased. As you can see, each truck equals is equivalent to 100 trucks. So with the pipeline in place, it will take a place of 2,040 trucks off the road. Now we want to emphasize not only the cost, that is this, the dollar sign cost that this is taking away from our economy, but as well as the, the cost of the carbon footprint emissions that we are taking off the road with a with this pipeline in place. Uh, from a financial perspective, we feel that there's no reason that this easement should be denied, and therefore we should go ahead and complete the pipeline. Now the reason that we are all here today is to view this specifically from an ethical analysis standpoint. What do each stakeholders have to gain, and what do each one have to lose? To start with, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. The word Oahe actually stands for foundation, the ground that we stand on. And for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Lake Oahe is their foundation. There are currently 8,300 tribal members, many of which are worried about their sacred land, their religion, their convictions. But more importantly, they're worried about the primary water source. This could affect their families, the environment, and their homes. In 2010, 
Um, the largest inland oil spill occurred in Michigan. This was caused from a six, six foot wide break in the pipeline um, due, to, due to the integrity of the pipeline being compromised. This is still in effect today. The aftermath is catastrophic and it's affecting, it's affected the citizens of that city. It took 18 hours for the company, the pipeline company, to actually hear that there was a burst in the pipeline, which made it catastrophically worse. This is a huge part of why the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe is concerned. This is the primary problem that we have to address. Next, we're gonna go on to the workers. As Austin previously stated, countless jobs are being made from this pipeline. I believe it was over 40,000 permanent or temporary jobs. This varies, there's permanent, there's temporary, jobs that will continue once the pipeline is actually done. But thinking about this in a broader perspective, these jobs wouldn't have been there if this pipeline hadn't started. These people would not be feeding their family. These people wouldn't have money um, to send their kids to school if they wanted to go to college. Next we're gonna go and focus on the general public, both directly and indirectly affected by this pipeline. Those who are on the border of the pipeline receive easement compensation. You can, you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be directly under your home. If it's on your acres of land, you don't see the pipeline under your house, but you're getting additional income because of it. This is not only helping the economy, but this is helping families. In addition to this, indirectly, federal property taxes, or federal taxes, not property taxes, um, are helping the communities. You can build schools, you can build highways, you can build parks for your family. In addition to this, um, gas prices will be dramatically reduced. Since we're no longer importing foreign oil and it's going to be on our land, that means we're closer to the oil. We get it fast.